On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 3. Gary Stimmon is here to discuss with me the image of gold. The image of gold. What an evocative image this is. We're going to be talking quite a bit about it during today's uh, program. Uh, I want to review chapter 2 of Daniel just briefly by saying that in the concluding verse of chapter 2, Daniel sat in the gate of the king. In other words, he had been elevated to the, ki uh, to the position of king's counselor or king's advisor, uh, obviously, because he was the one who was able to interpret the dream. Now, in this setting, with the king in place, Daniel as his advisor, Nebuchadnezzar is feeling very high and mighty, and we read in, in the first verse of chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. The famous image, 60 high by six wide. Interesting. Those numbers, of course, speak of the book of Revelation, chapter 13, and an image that will be set up in the end time by the Antichrist and world government, and all the people in the world will be forced to worship this image, to receive its mark in their right hand or forehead, which is connected to the number 600, threescore, and six. Gary, this has to have a relationship to that. Mm, it really has to have. It's uh, shall we say, a preview of things to come in the latter days. This image is, is uh, erected, and people are commanded to bow down before it. Now, in the preceding chapter, Daniel had prophesied to the king, saying in uh, the 38th verse, chapter 2, Thou art this head of gold. In other words, the statue with a head of gold, with a chest of silver, uh, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, represents the four great Gentile empires. The first being the Babylonian empire under Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel clearly told Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. So why wouldn't Nebuchadnezzar go out and build a wonderful large statue, perhaps of himself? No one knows what the image looked like. But it was of gold. It was of gold. And the demand was that all nations and languages fall down and worship when they hear the music. So he had the Babylonian Philharmonic Orchestra mm -hmm. there. Yes, he did. <laughs> he had all of the dignitaries there. Uh, for some strange reason, Daniel was gone. Maybe he was on a trip or something. Uh, Daniel was not there, at least according to the to the story here. The only three people left standing when everybody else bowed down and worshipped the image was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they got in trouble. They did indeed, <clears throat> because when the orchestra played, uh, they did not bow down. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, the uh, edict had been in verse 6, Whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now, if you've ever seen pictures of ancient Babylon, the whole place is brick. They loved, these Babylonians had mastered the art of bricklaying. In fact, if, if you look at pictures of the ruins today, J.R., you'll see stacks and stacks and stacks of broken down bricks, millions of them. Of course, the whole uh, city had been built of these fired bricks that were perhaps of, of eight inches by a foot and maybe a couple of inches thick, and then they were mortared. Now, to make brick, good hard brick, you have to have a good, uh, hot, fiery furnace. And they, they uh, well knew the art of stoking the furnace. Mm -hmm. Now, these three Hebrew boys just simply said, uh, we love you, we don't serve your gods, and we're not going to serve your gods. It says, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, if we die, they say, we die. Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Was he ever upset. Mm. The Bible says here, 
He was full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were his close advisors. Right. He loved these guys. Uh, he had given them a great deal of authority. And for them to stand up and say, look, king, you're a nice guy, we like you and all that, but we just cannot bring ourselves to worship this golden image. He was furious. And you know, J.R., this illustrates the old saying. Uh, perhaps it, uh, the saying was, was uh, derived in honor of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This was an absolute monarch. If you were his friend, you were the greatest person on earth. But the moment you expressed your own opinion, look out. That's exactly what happened here. And he ordered that the furnaces be stoked up, not in the normal way, but seven times hotter than they were usually heated. Now that's, uh, that's a hot furnace. Now let's, let's talk about it seven times here for a moment because we're looking at a future seven year tribulation period. You know, mm -hmm. just the numbers. Uh, the 66 and the 7 here right. certainly seem to have a relationship to the future. In the previous chapter, we saw 10 toes on this statue, and these represent 10 kings who in the last days will form democracies and establish a world government with the, with the idea of democracy. And uh, they will build this world government, and they are the ones who who sponsor this image that will be set up, Revelation chapter 13, and demand that all the people in the world worship this image and worship the beast um, and receive its mark in their right hand or in their forehead, or else they will not be able to participate in the marketplace. And of course, there will be a great number of people, in particular the Jews, who will refuse this mark and will have to go through a seven times fiery furnace. Sound like seven year tribulation? Sounds like seven years to me. In fact, the expression in the Hebrew, seven times, is uh, the very expression used to express seven years, as we are going to see later on in this book. A time is a year. For example, a half of the tribulation period is called a time times and a half. And you know, that time is a year. So here, the furnace is heated seven times hotter. It gives you a very clear indication this is a prophetic statement. Well, the men were ordered to throw uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the very hot furnace. It was so hot that uh, the three friends of Daniel survived it, but the people uh, commissioned to throw them into the furnace did not. They were burned up. So we have three Hebrew boys now in the fiery furnace, and they survived. God performs a miracle. And Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible says, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. Verse 25, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. What implications we have here. For Israel will go through the furnace of the tribulation period, but the Messiah, the Son of God, <laughs> will see that they make it through. They'll not only make it through, but he'll set up the kingdom. J.R., it strikes me, and we've already talked about this, the number four uh, is the kingdom number. Uh, it it re represents the created earth, which is eventually to be inherited by uh, Abraham's seed, through Isaac and Jacob. And the number of that kingdom is four. Here we have four men in the furnace, and, and to me that this strikes me it, it, uh, uh, that it may be an image of the kingdom to come. Yes, and you know, Gary, the three Hebrew boys certainly represent Israel. I have no doubt of that. Yes. But isn't it interesting that there are three, and there are three basic races of humanity today the offspring of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Mm -hmm. It's quite possible that they, in a larger sense, represent the whole world that's going to have to go through this fire of the tribulation period yes. and be saved by the coming of the Son of God in power and great glory. Well, you know, J.R., they do represent a, an aspect of Gentile culture because their names were changed when they were taken into the court of Babylon. 
uh, from Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, they have been to some degree, degree Gentile eyes. They, uh, and with the rest of the population of the nations, uh, they represent the terrible tribulation. And the deaths of those who threw them in also appear to be the uh, results of the tribulation period. So Nebuchadnezzar calls to them, says, come forth. And we'll tell you about it when we return in just a moment. The marvelous story to be seen in this chapter is God's delivery of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not from the fiery furnace, but in the midst of the fiery furnace. I want you to know God will go with you through the trials of this life. He does not promise to save you from the trials, but will go through with you through the trials. And Nebuchadnezzar now uh, brings them out of the furnace and finds that they have no smell of fire upon them, mm -hmm. that they survived marvelously. And so Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not worship any god except their own god. And then, Gary, he makes a decree that shows a certain character flaw in Nebuchadnezzar himself. Indeed, he does. He, in verse 29, he says, Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, language, which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Ouch. Ooh, <laughs> and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there's no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province, province of Babylon. This reveals a lot about his personality. He, I think in the He's modern- He's no offense, Stradler. <laughs> no, he was one way or the other. And you know, there is a mental disorder that used to be called the manic depressive, yes. where you would, would go from extreme mania to a, an in, introspective depression and then back again you know, on a rather uh, variable basis. Today it's called bipolar disorder. The king seems to be that kind of personality. Well, in the very next chapter, he goes crazy, insane for seven years. We'll see that when we get to chapter four. But Gary, this certainly uh, is an amazing turn of events yeah. because the Antichrist himself, I think, will be just that kind of person. In our concluding uh, few minutes, let's look at uh, Daniel's chap Daniel chapters two and three, uh, comparing and contrasting what we find there. In chapter two, we found the statue that represented the four great world empires, starting with the head of gold. In chapter three, we find a huge 60 cubit, about 110 foot high gold statue, which becomes an object of worship. So in w one of the statues seems to represent uh, Gentile governance. The other statue sim seems to represent religion or false religion. And you know, J.R., it strikes me, those are the two aspects of Mystery Babylon the Great that we find when we come to uh, the book of Revelation, the two sides of it. In Revelation chapter 13, we have two images. One, you know, is the leopard with the feet of the bear and the mouth of the lion and ten uh, horns and uh, uh, seven heads. Uh, this represents world government. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, it is made up of all of those uh, aspects of the first beast here that uh, Nebuchadnezzar dreams about mm -hmm. yes. with, the, with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. We have uh, those four aspects, which, by the way, also compare with chapter 7 of Daniel, which we'll see when we get there. But then we have this image that is set up, and uh, it's an image to the beast, mm -hmm. to be sure, and all the world is forced to worship it. You know, I think it's probably uh, God drawing a veil across uh, a particular truth here in Daniel 3, because we have the image but specifically, the image is not named. Now, it could have been an image of, let's say, some female goddess. It could be an image of Bel, uh, Marduk. Could be an image of Baal. Uh, could be a dragon image. We just don't know. It could have been a beautiful, stylized dragon. 
a as we speculated earlier, it might have been maybe a lion with eagle's wings and Nebuchadnezzar's head on top of the lion. Uh, and he thereby would be seen as a god. We just don't know what the image is. There is an idol deity attached to this image because the three Hebrew boys said, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not worship thy gods, mm. nor the golden image. Right. Yeah. And so it uh, seems to have some connection there. Now we uh, want to take another look also at the image in chapter 2. It has the head of gold, chest of silver, belly of brass, legs of iron. The feet uh, are iron mixed with so-called miry clay. We read in Daniel 2.43. Now that miry uh -huh. clay in the Hebrew uh, is a, uh, a type of clay the, that, that w is brittle, frangible, uh, it doesn't hold its shape. If you, if you crumbled it in your hands, it would fall to dust. In other words, it has no structural strength whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I want to read Daniel 2.43, Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And it has been asked, who, well, who is this mysterious they who shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Well, the classic explanation is that this represents a combination of a totalitarian form of government with a democratic form of government represented by the clay. But you know, Gary, that's not exactly the way verse 43 reads, is it? No, it's not. It is not. In fact, uh, very clearly, the, uh, it says, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now, J.R., the only precedent we have for this is pre-flood, where the sons of God came and mixed their seed in an illegal uh, fashion with the daughters of men and produced a race of monsters who had to be destroyed. And I'm thinking of the words of Jesus when he said about the last days, that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, perhaps this genetic disruption corruption could occur all over again. In the last 50 years or so, uh, people have been conditioned to love dragons, lizards, yeah. dragon people, sure. demonic, hideous looking creatures, because they are benevolent aliens from another galaxy somewhere. Is the world being prepared for an alien invasion? In, in my opinion, absolutely yes. All of our uh, popular entertain, in, entertainment media have adopted this as a major theme that man must be saved by an external force. There's a second element here, JR, and that's genetic research, the Human Genome Project, which is, claims that uh, once they decode the genetic book of humankind, that they can make any kind of modifications they want to and produce any kind of being they want to. It is the ultimate in arrogancy. Mm. Well, we have in this second chapter this miry clay and the iron, something trying to mix with the seed of men and it not being successful. Obviously, it won't be successful. It won't be successful. And then comes a mountain of... Um, a stone cut out without hands that comes and destroys the world system and set up, sets up a kingdom and becomes a great mountain. It's kind of interesting the term mountain here is used to refer to the kingdom of God. Absolutely. And you know, this is presaged in Deuteronomy 32 where we have the fivefold rock representing Christ who stands up for his people in the end of days. And and J.R., I think that that rock, as he is re referred to by Moses, is also the stone cut out without hands here. Jesus is the rock. I um, heard a fellow say, uh, uh, my feet's on the rock and my name's in the, on the roll. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's good. But uh, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Because he alone can give you eternal life. Um, the world is about to enter into a tribulation period. I can tell you, world government is on its way. Uh, the rise of the Antichrist, the last form, these ten toes are about to make their appearance. 
And when that happens, the world is going to go through the fiery furnace. Now, you don't have to go through the fiery furnace. You can be saved from the fiery furnace by trusting in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior today. I hope you will. I hope you'll realize that you are a sinner in need of salvation. You'll pray a simple sinner's prayer and ask the Lord to forgive you and save you. He will if you'll ask him. Well, this is a fascinating study and there'll be more on our next program. We'll be back in just a moment.